Hello everyone, this is a video on the web interface of a hyperoptic Nokia HA-140W-B router. This is intended to make it easy for anyone who has to remotely help friends or family or um, I guess customers who have these routers when you do not have one of these routers in front of you yourself. On the back of the router uh, the third line down on the sticker on the back has the admin password. The default username is admin and then the password is, unless it's been changed, is uh, the third line down on the sticker on the back. Default IP address of this router is 192.168.1.1. So when you log in, it does warn you that you should uh, possibly change the default passwords and you are given a uh, set of information about the health of the network. So this one isn't connected to an active hyperoptic line. So what you will see on some of these pages won't match what uh, an active service will show. So it shows on the first page what device it is and what other devices are connected to it. Device information gives you a lot more details such as serial number and uh, firmware versions, uptime, how long the, the route has been switched on. LAN status shows you the wireless name and how many packets have been transmitted and what wireless channel it's on. Further down on the page you have Ethernet information which shows you which of the network sockets, so it's individually sh uh, shows you the status and also what speed they're connected at. So if you're supporting somebody and they're going, oh, I'm only getting 100 megabit or 95 megabits per second, you could look at this page remotely and uh, see that one of the LAN ports is connected at 100 megabit because their computer only has 100 megabit NIC or, or something very similar, or uh, possible cable damage as well. WAN status on mine will not show anything. As I say, it's not connected to an active hyperoptic line. And very likely the same for the WAN uh, IPv6 status. Home networking is pretty much similar to the LAN status. And again, very similar on the statistics part as well. Voice information would be where you'd see information on the VoIP service that Hyperoptic might sell. And then we'll go into the settings parts. So this bit was all under the status. We're now going to go into the settings. So under network you have LAN and that shows the IP address and where you could set the IP address on the LAN and what DHCP range it uses and whether DHCP is enabled. You can also set static entries for DHCP so if you always wanted a printer to be on the same IP address rather than setting the static IP on the printer you can fill it in on here or additionally fill it in uh, in this section and the router won't hand that out to any other device. For the IPv6 section, there's a lot of stuff that I'm afraid I'm yet to fully understand because IPv6, although pretty ancient in the scheme of the internet, is still very rarely deployed. Um, so there's a lot of settings that I am yet to uh, really play about with and understand. In the wireless 2.4 gigahertz section you can set the 2.4 gigahertz wireless settings such as the password and the wireless name, maximum number of devices that can connect um, and some other things. When you do this generally you want the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz to be the same name so if you change the name or the password in this screen you do also need to remember to go over to the 5 gigahertz section and mirror the changes over there as well. Uh, some people do like having their networks named differently so uh, 
for example, some iPhones will um, drop to 2.4 gigahertz and stay on that. Um, and the only easy way to stop that from happening is to have one of them called, for example, Hyperoptic 2.4 and call your other network Hyperoptic 5 gigahertz. And you can only put in um, the 5 gigahertz on the iPhone and uh, you'll always know that it will be on the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Wireless schedule, which looks like you can uh, tell it to turn the wireless off and on at certain times. So for example, Monday through to Friday, you can have it turning on at 9 a.m. and switching off at 5.30 p.m. DNS is quite interesting. It looks like you can possibly usurp or uh, override domain names. So uh, one of these would be, I don't know, I guess deploy.proview.co.uk for some VoIP phones which um, retrieve their settings off of uh, this cloud provider. Uh, you could override that and send that to localhost or wherever you wanted. Well, it doesn't like using localhost, so let's do just an IP that's not going to uh, respond with valid data. Not entirely sure what the origin domain and new domain might be. That might be um, domain rewriting at a guess. So you could say all requests which come in for yahoo.co.uk replace with google.com so, uh, or .co.uk. So if somebody went to mail.yahoo.co.uk, it's possible that it would uh, respond or, or um, do a lookup for mail.google.co.uk in the background and then return that to the user. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's quite an unusual option to have in uh, in a router, in a, or at least a consumer router. Mesh is almost certainly some kind of Wi-Fi mesh system and almost certainly something that Nokia haven't yet come out with. Uh, I haven't checked, but if it's anything like XyXL, it's um, been in the pipeline and they keep saying it's going to be released and coming soon and the stuff has never materialized yet in the web interface of their routers there are um, mesh options which are not yet usable so going on to the security section which will be firewalls and um, settings like that we've had trouble with this router trying to enable WAN ping um, no matter what was selected within these options, we still couldn't get it to respond to ping. Um, for most hyperoptic users, that may be normal because uh, hyperoptic use carrier grade NAT, where you will be sharing an IP address with lots of customers. So uh, generally, that won't respond to pings, or probably won't respond to pings, uh, and certainly wouldn't respond to uh, a ping from your own router. If it did respond, it would be the carrier grade NAT device within hyperoptic. However, uh, the connection that we were testing this on did have a static IP address, static public IP address, and we still couldn't get the router to respond to pings um, yet. If you replace this Nokia with a third-party router, it worked absolutely fine. So um, there's something a little bit wonky with uh, the firewall settings on here. It then has Mac filtering, which is a very bad way to secure your network. Um, it's very trivial to spoof a MAC address. So if you're using this section and you have uh, technical users on your network, then expect that they probably know how to get around blocking of uh, MAC addresses. IP address filtering, which I presume would mean you could block access to, for example, OpenDNS, you could put in um, 208.67.222.222 .222 .222 .222 .222 .222 .222 .222 
um, tell it to block all and people on the LAN wouldn't be able to reach that. URL filter is very unlikely to work these days because almost everything is HTTPS or port 443 which is uh, encrypted and the router won't be able to see the address being accessed. So uh, I mean, you can enable this and see what the settings would do. HTTPS is not supported, so in effect I would say that this entire feature in this router is now redundant because so little traffic on the internet uses port 80 or um, just plain HTTP, so ignore that, that's pretty going to be very useless. Parental control. Let's do the base one, that's probably going to be easier to go through. Access control enabled. We can add a policy for Jamie's computer for that device which has already been detected. And you can enable it, or I guess disable access a bit like with the wireless schedule at certain times and uncertain days of the week. Moving on to DMZ and Application Layer Gateway, ALGs. So DMZ is Demilitarized Zone, uh, which is normally the lazy way of port forwarding. So a lot of guides for uh, game consoles just say, oh, put it in the DMZ, uh, which is a really bad way of getting around port forwards and other things. But there we go. So if you wanted to send all of your traffic uh, bearing in mind that you'd need to have a static IP address add-on from uh, Hyperoptic because otherwise you'll be on carrier grade NAT and uh, this DMZ function won't do anything. Uh, enable DMZ and then you select the device that you want it to go through to and that will essentially uh, forward every port through to that device. Up at the top here we have application layer gateways which are there supposed to be there to help stuff work over the internet uh, through NAT or network address translation. Quite often um, the stuff that it messes up will be VPNs, so uh, if you find you have trouble, uh, VPNs and VoIP, if you find you have trouble with VPNs or VoIP I would recommend unticking for VPNs, LTTP, IPsec and PPTP, and if you're having trouble with VoIP it's worth unticking SIP and then seeing if the problem goes away. Moving on to application, which is stuff like port forwarding and dynamic DNS. So port forwarding, it has a bunch of defaults. Let's do uh, Half-Life, you know, which hides a lot of the port stuff because it's uh, defaults it there. So I'll we'll port forward Half-Life through to uh, the computer I'm using. Not entirely sure whether that's submitted or not. It's uh, oh, it did. It just gave no feedback that it was going to do so, and it's added a bunch of ports. In fact, a whole load that I expect aren't needed. Uh, certainly, two seven hundred. Um, this bunch might be, but I'm not sure about these lower ones. And uh, to remove it, it looks like you have to. You can add it in a bulk in bulk, but to uh, remove them, it looks like you have to delete every single one, one by one. And I'll just quickly go through doing a custom port forward as well in, uh, in a moment once I've removed all of these. Okay, so custom port forward, WAN port, let's do port uh, 8080. I'll see whether we can leave LAN port blank because I want it to come through to port 8080 on this computer. And I want it to be TCP. I want to enable the mapping, and there's only one uh, WAN connection, so I want it to be on that one, and I'm going to call it uh, Squid Proxy. 
Okay, so you do have to fill in the LAN port. It doesn't assume that it's the same. So there we go. That's how you add a port forward. And it can do port translation. So if uh, you needed it listening on 8080 on the uh, WAN, but going through to port 80 on uh, the LAN side, you just fill in those two different values there. And then you have DDNS, which is dynamic DNS, where if you are on a dynamic IP address, then uh, and your IP address hops around, you can use a Dyn DNS provider to map a name to your IP address. So you could have it called Jason's Home dot No IP dot org, and uh, that would always follow your dynamic IP address. Once again, this function's probably not very useful on Hyperoptic because if you are on their carrier grade NAT dynamic IP settings, um, you can't connect back into your connection anyway because of the you're sharing an IP with lots of other customers. Uh, and then in the other mode, which is their static IP address offering, you have a static IP address anyway, so there's no point using a dynamic DNS uh, provider because your IP address will always be the same. Moving on to USB, so on the back of the router there are two USB ports and uh, it looks like you can use it as a file server and a print server. UPnP, again, will only be very useful for those people on Hyperoptic who have a static IP address, otherwise the ports that get forwarded by UPnP will not be accessible to the outside world anyway because of carrier grade NAT. UPnP is a technology which allows software or devices within your network to automatically set up port forwards through to themselves. So for example, Hikvision uh, NVRs or uh, CCTV boxes will use UPnP um, to open up the correct ports so that people outside of the building can connect uh, and view cameras using the app. Moving on to the maintenance section, you can change the admin password. You can run a speed test, which we have done, and it is really, really inaccurate. So if you're relying on this speed test function to see uh, whether your hyperoptic is performing optimally or not, it's not accurate and it's not worth using. Uh, the best thing you can do is using a wired computer uh, install the Ookla speed test app and definitely the application rather than the website and then run the test from there. The website tends to give again uh, lower than expected results mainly I think because of all the adverts which jump around uh, on the page while you're running the test. Speed test history which there won't be because I haven't run any speed tests since I factory reset it Device management, looks like you could rename computers, so if you didn't like the name of, well, for example, this, if this was a default Windows install, it would just be called laptop dash and then a load of numbers and letters, and you could rename it to Jason's laptop or, or whatever you wanted to. Backup and restore, you can back up the config if you wanted to make a change and then, uh, or factory reset and then restore the config or move the config to another uh, similar router. Remote reboot the device, remote factory reset the device, and a diagnostic screen where you can do pings and trace routes of stuff on the LAN or the WAN. And there we go, that's about it for this router. It's not a great router. If you do have hyperoptic and you're uh, vaguely technically inclined, I would absolutely recommend replacing this router with something of your own, so something based on Tomato or DDWRT or uh, a Netgear Nighthawk or something that isn't this Nokia or the um, the other, the Hyperoptic Tilgin router is also not very good. Hopefully this video has been helpful to you. If it has, it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the video notifications switched on, but the subscriber numbers really do help. Thanks.